Inside Foos presents Foos Talk Live. It has been such a challenge, and we'll talk more about this when Mark and uh, Adam join us here in a minute, but it has been such a challenge to be able to take different eras, different styles, uh, different levels of competition, all of these various factors that we had to somehow put together, meld together, use a percentage of this, a percentage of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to look at players' resume, we had to look at, at the strength of an era, the longevity of their career, what their peers thought of them. Um, were they the best player in, in the world at any time in their careers? Uh, and then the eye test also, you know, of just watching the player. Sure. And, and I think when it comes down to tonight, um, the, the top 10, um, you know, this is all of these players, I think, on the top 10 tonight, at one point in their career or another, we're considered the best player in the world. And, and that's kind of what, okay. what you would expect from a top 10, wouldn't you? It's Foos Talk Live. You talking to me? Compelling and lively banter. Are you going to talk to us? Talking foosball. Foosball was how I measured my value as a man. You took that away. Players and fans, promoters and pros, unedited and raw. Talk, talk, talk. Living in the moment. We have a lot of important things to talk about. All while practicing social distancing. Cool. We'll talk. No big whoop. Let's get this thing started. Foos Talk Live. Hey there, it's Tom Robinson from all of us here at Foos Talk Live. Happy Mother's Day. We're all taking time off to celebrate Mom's Day, even if she doesn't play foosball. For episode 108, we look back at what's arguably Foos Talk Live's greatest hit, not just for the last year, but for our entire existence as the world's greatest foosball podcast. Tonight, we recap the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players of All Time on the American Tour, brought to you in part by InsideFoos.com, offering monthly subscriptions with access to some of the most exciting matches ever recorded, plus live tournaments, pre- and post-show analysis, interviews, and original programming. Sign up now at InsideFoos.com. Also brought to you by ProtectoFlex, the world's premier foosball safety accessory. Go to Protecto-Flex.com. Brought to you by Rod Lock. Practice more, reach less. The best practice tool in foosball. Visit rod-lock.com. And brought to you by 518 Prints, one of the best printers of promotional items and foosball apparel. Visit 518prints.com today. Also brought to you by Foosballers The Movie. This Joe Hesslinger foosball documentary is now available as a worldwide download at foosballersthemovie.com. Also brought to you by the USTSO, helping to usher in a new era of competitive foosball. Become a member at usafoosball.com. And brought to you by Foosball Clubs USA, promoting foosball through school systems all over the United States. Visit foosballclubsusa.com and make a donation today. Jim, Mark, Adam, and Dave Gummison work very hard on the top 50 foosball players on the American Tour of All Time list. We're about to replay that entire list for you this evening and include the team's comments on the task. Let's return now to January 2nd of 2022. In disagreements, what it's all about. I mean, obviously yeah. different opinions. It has been such a challenge, and we'll talk more about this when Mark and uh, Adam join us here in a minute, but it has been such a challenge to be able to take different eras, different styles, uh, different levels of competition, all of these various factors that we had to somehow put together, meld together, use a percentage of this, a percentage of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to look at players' resume. We had to look at, at the strength of an era, the longevity of their career, what their peers thought of them. Um, were they the best player in, in the world at any time in their careers? Uh, and then the eye test also, you know, of just watching a player. Sure. And, and I think when it comes down to tonight, um, the, the top 10, um, you know, this is all of these players, I think, on the top 10 tonight, at one point in their career or another, we're considered the best player in the world. And, and that's kind of what okay. you would expect from a top 10, wouldn't you? Okay. Now, it's uh, the criteria obviously has to be extraordinary because of the depth uh, going all the way back into the 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, of course the 2000s. What, uh, what an extraordinary task. I think I, I take my hat off to all you guys for, uh, for taking your, uh, put your reputation on the line here to, to come up with this list. And uh, we should probably mention uh, David Gummison because he was also a contributor of this list. Yeah, yep, for sure. 
But uh, yeah, this this ought to be very interesting. And of course, what would uh, the year twenty twenty two be without with uh, our our own agent provocateur, uh, our uh, our dumpster fire master, uh, <laughs> and of course uh, former teen idol and uh, and uh, karaoke king. Uh, Mark Torres. Mark, hello. Um, the man who Tom, started that fire in the dumpster. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, you said uh, you said enchilada. Thank which you. Is a uh, a flipping reminder honest. that you are the whitest human being I've ever personally <laughs> known. It's you, English people with the worst accent of all time don't say enchilada. Okay, let's okay, start there. Okay. Um, all right, well, I'll, let I'll, me let me just let me defend myself and say that back in in uh, you know high school, I failed Spanish one twice. <laughs> so not apparently. only that, you've never met actually met a Mexican. Oh, uh, I'm dressed. I'm dressed to the nines to uh, like a Zoom call. I'm wearing a shirt and no pants. This is how I do it <laughs> yeah. at work. This is how I do it here. <laughs> so um, let's rock. invite Adam in because he has he has choice oh. words about enchilada as well. I have a no, special, I was uh, I was going to ask. Special intro you. for you, Adam. Of course, uh, oh. is, we found out recently you are, uh, are a, a legendary butt smoker, uh, which, <laughs> of course, we need we need to, to, to be uh, completely... Oh, we put it on the air? Is this on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love how your mom called um, you. He does mean, you mean pork, pork butt. Pork butt. Yeah, we're talking about barbecue. Yes. With Adrian yeah, Zamora. For sure. Yes, you and Adrian, both uh, legendary. Well, I don't know in my own head, but um, <laughs> but yeah. smoker. Let's see. No, we covered the butt smoker. We got the enchilada. Okay, so back to the list. So you know what? What we do for those of you out there in in the the fanverse land uh, before the show is we usually have a pre game show and just tell each other our favorite knock knock jokes and you know get really serious mm-hmm. about things. But tonight's pre game show felt different to me. Like different. It felt a little bit more grab. There was a bit more gravity. I mean, it's not like we're unveiling a cure for a major disease, but you could feel it. Like this is an important list. It's it's it it's, is. I, it's it's important to get out there, and it's even more important to create the conversation that it is very clearly doing. Yeah. And it's something that we can always we can always revisit, revisit in different ways. But it's out there. It's mm-hmm. been thought about incredibly on a very deep level, looking at a, a bunch of different angles. So I'm happy with it. I'm I'm really I'm really happy that we're doing this and I'm really excited for this top 10 tonight. Yeah, there, there's the final 10. There is finally consensus. And I, and I know uh, that actually last week's list was more difficult because you guys kept going back and forth and right up to the last second as to who was going to go where. And uh, you know why Tom? So a couple of things, the reason why that is, is because we only have 10 names left to play with. Okay. There's still plenty of argument that some of the people from 11 through 20 shouldn't have been in the top 10. Mm. There's still plenty of disagreement and engagement. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so that's the one thing. I think the other thing that's very revealing about this is how there are bias. There's inherent bias or error bias for that matter, where people leaned toward their era. And so, you know, D- Dave leaned, leaned heavily toward the seventies. I think we had this conversation. Yep. Jim's kind of spread out a little bit, but a, l- a little bit toward the modern era. And I, and I leaned toward the nineties and we have to account for all of that. And it would be true for anyone to p- participating in this list, which is why I think the um, combined historical and factual and uh, on, uh, you know, actual a priori knowledge of the experience is oh. critical. Dave was there. Jim was there for part of it. Adam was there for the you know the early two thousands. I was there for the nineties. And cumulatively, it takes that kind of uh, it takes that kind of interest and information. Otherwise, if you give someone the opportunity to do a top fifty list and they only started playing in two thousand ten, mm-hmm. it's going to be a really wonky list. It's going to be a broken list, frankly. Anyway, that's no, my rant. If you could uh, just do me a favor and spell a priori, I. A. That's, that's brilliant, Mark. First time I've, I've heard that word on the show for sure. <laughs> you know, well, also a neat thing tonight. You know, after the list is over, we're gonna we're gonna have a roundtable. We're gonna talk about different things who we thought should be on or shouldn't be on, or maybe players who were higher or lower than we felt they should have been. Um, and a, a little bit about the process, and, and I'm sure we'll debate a little bit, yeah. and also invite, I think, uh, comments from uh, from fans out there as well. So that should be interesting. Uh, one final thought for me before we have a drink. Um, <laughs> It's been an amazing process for me. You know, I, I, I basically have gone in and put together these bios for these 50 players and really learned some things and remembered some things and really gained great appreciation for the different eras and the greatness of all of these players. But it's really been really therapeutic to some degree for me as well to sort mm. of 
really experience the full history of what is an amazing sport. Yes. With a history that was well documented in foosballers and one that, you know, when I tell people that I meet and I see foosball, it has this amazing history, you know, uh, and it truly does. And so this has been the process itself has just been really wonderful for me. And, and now the culmination tonight. Uh, and I think I don't know that we nailed it, but we pre- pre- came pretty damn close to nailing this list, guys. We, we all of us, I think, did a great job um, in in really putting thought and experience and uh, our knowledge of the game into it. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of, of the whole process. Throughout the history of professional American foosball competition, the top players have waged war. Many have tried and many have failed. Inside Foos and Foosball Radio unite to bring you the names of those who stand above the rest. The greatest players in American Pro Tour Foosball. From the 70s, 80s, 90s to present day, we are proud to present the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Pro Tour History. This list has been compiled by experts, hermetically sealed in a mayonnaise jar, locked in the vault of the firm Stevens, Torres, and Gilson, and hand delivered under arm guard to the studios of Foos Talk Live. Each Sunday, Until January 2nd, 2022, we will reveal the top 50 foosball players in American Pro Tour history. Tonight, we present to you the players ranked from 50 to 41. The Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Pro History begins with a tie. Eddie Gartman and Larry Chesbrough in at number 50. Coming in at number 49 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Pro Tour History, Don Swan. Now, the player coming in at number 48 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Pro History, Ron Nevoy. Here's the player who's ranked number 47 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Pro History, Liz Hill Moore. Next, the player ranked at number 46 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Pro History, Steve Biney. Moving on to number 45 on the Foos Talk Live, top 50 foosball players in American pro tour history, Kerry Walliger. Coming in at number 44 on the Foos Talk Live, top 50 foosball players in American pro tour history, Gary File. Next. The player ranked at number 43 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Pro Tour History, Don Shalafo. Moving on to the number 42 position on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Pro Tour History, Gus Trevino. Now, rounding out this week's list at number 41 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Pro Tour History, Kevin Keeter. We continue with the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History. Coming in at number 40, Bob Maloney. Coming in at number 39 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Brandon Moreland. Now, the player coming in at number 38 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Tina Wyatt. 
Here's the player who's ranked number 37 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History. Billy Sumption. Next, the player ranked at number 36 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Gil Jackson. Moving on to number 35 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Ken Allwell. Coming in at number 34 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, John Smith. Next, the player ranked at number 33 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Tim Zeke Burns. Moving on to the number 32 position on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Scott Weidman. Rounding out this week's Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History at number 31, Steve Simon. We continue with the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History. Coming in at number 30, Tom Yor Sr. Coming in at number 29 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Moya Tielens. Now, the player coming in at number 28 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Mike Bells. Here's the player who's ranked number 27 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Greg Jeep Perry. Next, the player ranked at number 26 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Adrian Zamora. Moving on to number 25 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Bob Diaz. Coming in at number 24 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Brent Bednar. Next, the player ranked at number 23 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Lewis Cartwright. Moving on to the number 22 position on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Tracy McMillan. Rounding out this week's Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History. Coming in at number 21, Johnny Lott. We continue with the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History. Coming in at number 20, Rick Martin. Coming in at number 19 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Tony Bacon. Now, the player coming in at number 18 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Steve Murray. Here's the player who's ranked number 17 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Jim Wiswell. Next, the player ranked at number 16 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Dave Gummison. 
Moving on to number 15 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History, Lori Schrenz. Coming in at number 14 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Robert Mares. Next, the player ranked at number 13 on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Mike Bowers. Moving on to the number 12 position on the Blues Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, Johnny Horton. Rounding out this week's Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History, number 11, Tommy Adkisson. We present to you the players ranked from 10 through number one. We continue with the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History. Coming in at number 10, Billy Pappas. Coming in at number nine on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History. Dan Kaiser. Now, the player at number eight on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History. Ego is not a bad thing. You know, having, a, having an ego is what has let many players win this game. I mean, if you think of the greats, uh, even back in the day, like like Horton I, uh, or Tommy, uh, I mean, these guys were destroying people. And guess what? I guarantee you, their ego carried them through many championships and gave them many titles. Ryan Moore. Here's the player who's ranked number seven on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History. Like a lot of kids, there's, we don't have discipline, mm -hmm. and we, we, we play really fast. So when I realized, hey, I need to move to this next level, what do I need to do? I need to value my possessions. I would actually tell myself, think like Terry. The thing that he was known for is just being 100% consistent all the time and right. making good decisions and playing smart. Terry Moore. Next, the player ranked at number six on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History. I just lost my mind and a couple guys started screaming at me that I knew and it, I just freaked out and it worked. I didn't know what to do. It just beat me so bad, I just had to get crazy and it worked, so I'll take it, man. Tom Spear. Moving on to number five. On the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Foosball Players in American Tour History. Now, we used, I used to have so much fun. We would go to war. I mean, the table would be rocking and we would be screaming and I mean, the balls would be flying. But as soon as the match was over, we'd be outside laughing and cutting up. Cindy Head. We're down to number four on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History. At number four, Doug Furry. Next, the player ranks at number three on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History. In my opinion, you can see someone's personality coming out in the way that they play. Sure, you know, you correct. express yourself through the way that you play. When you play, you want to have a good time. You want to have fun. And yeah, I didn't say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this to be different. I want to be an individual. That was never the case. Right. It was what felt right to me and what I enjoyed doing. Right. And, and, I, and that's how I enjoyed playing foosball. So. Tony Spraydeman. And now, we move on to the number two position on the Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History. I try to be fair, and that's really kind of a big thing. When I was younger, I really didn't like people that weren't fair. Now I understand that there, it, there's a lot of depth to the vision, but like I said, that was the part of me that was like Tony, I would find reasons to not like people but that's not really my nature either. I'm kind of good-hearted, and I don't, I don't like all that drama. That's why I don't like the popularity. Todd Lofredo. Yeah. 
Now, the moment you have been waiting for. The Foos Talk Live Top 50 Players in American Tour History now reveals the number one player. When it comes to being the best foosball player in the world, which you have been and, and still are considered as one of the best, if not the best. Who's the purest, best player? Yeah. Him by far, in my opinion. The, the best player, player is, is Frederico. Frederico Colignon. Yeah, you know, to me and another guy that I've had a chance to cover from the very beginning, it's actually inarguable, in my opinion. Um, this is the greatest player, quite simply the greatest player that foosball has ever seen, the greatest player to ever grace the rods, a, a legendary performer who has won world championships on 10 different tables. Here's a stat for you. This should pretty much say it all. Frederick Collignon tripled five times at the tornado world 2000 2002 2004 2007 and then his very last appearance in in 2012 he won a total of 26 world titles on the american tour that is the most ever for a male player and the thing that's funny is that tornado despite that incredible excellence might have been his worst table yeah, uh, he was really unchallenged on every other table in the world. Nobody touched him. You know, I would go to the the Bonzini World Championships, and he would triple every year. Um, and if someone won a, a a game against him, they would celebrate. You know, if a Frenchman won the game, the French national anthem would break out. They were so happy about it. You know, he also added probably another ten plus titles in Las Vegas at the Hall of Fame Classic. And he, the one time he came came to the national championships one time, two thousand and two, in Atlanta. And he quadrupled. He won open singles. He won open doubles with Lafredo. He won open mixed. And he won masters singles that year as well. Um, reached his first final ever back in 1998. And then just literally right after that tournament, paired up with Todd Lafredo. And of course, after that, uh, they really rewrote the history books. When you um, when it's count forward shootout, goalie war, DYPs, and every other specialty event, he probably won more than 50 individual world titles. This is a guy who would play every single event at the Tornado Worlds and go deep into every competition and win everything. My wife, Amy, I was talking with her earlier. Uh, she drew him in 2009 in a DYP that had about 200 uh, teams in it. They lost the first round, and Amy didn't block a single shot, couldn't clear the ball. And after the, after the match is over, Fred looks over and says, sorry, sorry, I, I, I should have been better, you know, taking full responsibility. They then went on and won their next 16 matches and, and won, the, won the, the, the event. Um, you know, the first time I ever saw them, uh, 1996, um, I think it was actually 95 I saw him. He's a young European player coming in, um, comes in, plays some of the lower events. He's shooting a pin shot, which we all knew you know, no one could shoot a pin shot on this table and have any success. Uh, in 1996, he finishes uh, in the top 10 in open doubles, open singles, and open mixed doubles. And this is when we first got kind of got the idea. And then we got excited about him. We, we watched him. I, I saw him and I said, this guy's got something. He's special. He's different. You know, if anybody can win with a pin series or a European style game, it's this guy. Literally as close to perfection as we have ever seen on a foosball table. Inducted into the United States Table Soccer Hall of Fame, also a member of the International Hall of Fame, of course, in 2014, um, of course, at number one. And there's only one guy, in my opinion, that this could be, uh, despite the greatness of all these others. It's Frederic Collignon. Yeah, Fred is a true foosball savant. He's a genius outside of foosball. I believe he has eidetic memory. I think he has photographic memory. Uh, his hand speed, when you talk to other masters who you think have great hand speed, they will tell you that Fred's hand speed is lights out, not even the same. You know, like Billy Pappas, who's known for having incredibly fast hands, and Tony Spriedman as well, with all the hard work and dedication and commitment, the fans are well, hands are lightning fast. They'll just both tell you, no one's got hands like Fred. And what happens when all the stars line up? And once again, not to overuse it, he's like the next level. Like you get these generational football players, and then you add this whole other crazy intellect and um, muscle memory and actual photographic memory and physical ability, and then the determination to win, and the closing, like the dude is a shark, smells blood in the water. How many times have we seen him in a 4-4 situation, pass and score like it's a 0-0 situation? By far, that is the biggest differentiator. I have had these arguments all over uh, social media, mostly because they're entertaining for me, but also because it's not that I don't believe them, but 
it's this idea that a, a master is someone who wins championships. A master is someone who has the mental toughness and the self-awareness and the emotional intelligence and puts it all together and the physical ability and closes matches and wins them. And the differentiating or the gap between the people that win and lose happens when the pressure's on. There's plenty of science and research and study on what happens to the body and the brain when you're in a tense situation and how your motor skills just shut down. This is why this is what separates the men from the boys in the championships is the people that could do this. And Fred just did it like Fred just did it like like it was easy. Like how many times have we seen him do it? So the last story I'll tell about Fred is I had the great privilege of designing a belt with Fred for our Kickstarter. And we were putting the belt together and uh, and I, I give him I give him the first draft of the belt and it has his championships from every year on both sides of the belt. And I believe it's right. And I run it by Jim and Jim thinks it's right. And Fred's like, nope, it's not right. There's something missing from 2003 and it's open mixed. And I'm like, hmm, Fred, I, I'm, are you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, this is wrong. And so lo and behold, man, the guy knows every single thing he won because we were wrong. He won, he's, he won something every single year. And I got a look, he won an open chant, an open uh, event every single year starting in 2006. No, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Um, 98. From 98 on, he won a world title mm -hmm. every single year from, two, from 98 to 2012, at least one. Yep. And most years it was multiple. So there's never been a foosball a foozer like him. And there, you know, it's hard to say these kinds of things because it's, you know, you use these superlatives. I can't imagine anyone ever being as dominant as him ever again. I just can't. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how it would ever happen. So um, not just a generational player, a, a unicorn of a foozer, and we'll probably never see anything like this man ever again. That's my Frederick Brandt. Yeah, um, yeah, I am. Um, I want to. I, I want to say uh, one or two things about him. But Mark, I, I do want to bring up something that um, you posted a long time ago, well, maybe a year or two ago, about a conversation that you had with him. Right? Do you remember this? You posted yeah. on Facebook about how yes. you brought. He brought up something that happened like five hundred thousand years ago. A match that you you and him played. Right? And, yes. And he remembered to the T the way that I kind of remember what my son's face looks like. Maybe I don't yes. know. Could you speak to that for a quick second? Because yeah. you talked about the, his memory. Yes, I played him in open singles in 04 in the first round. and uh, No, second round, sorry. So I destroyed some rookie that I can't even remember what the heck happened in the game. And then I played Fred in the next round, and he destroyed me. And we were having a conversation about it. He brought up details from the match. And I'm like, dude, I have no... What are you talking about? And so uh, he remembered, like, and I remembered it because it was a memory for me, but I didn't even remember it in the detail he remembered it. And so it was really like, are you serious, dude? That, that's like, I'm your second round opponent. You, you ran over me and you won the tournament. And so, okay, <laughs> it's, it was really, really mind blowing. But you know, I'll let you, I want you to continue on, but there are a couple guys like that. I, I had an hour phone call with Johnny Horton uh, right before this. Um, this uh, this uh, Foos uh, Talk Live uh, thing we're having right now, and he remembers stuff in absolute detail. There's a handful of these guys, and maybe gals too. I don't know any of the gals, but they remember with photographic memory the minutia of matches they played. Anyway, Adam. Yeah, no, th thank you. I, I, I just yeah. love that story. because, And it really speaks to what I want to talk about, about uh, 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 Colignon, is that... Um, there was something early on when I first heard about him, when I first started playing, the, the great Kathy Brainerd told me that he is poetry in motion. And that's a, a term that gets bandied about a lot, but it is actually quite literally true. He is poetry in motion. And on the outside looking in, if you don't play that much, or if you're, you're new to the game, or if you're even like trying to rise up in the ranks, you look at a player like him play, and it's not barely discernible from magic. And that's what makes him so great. But... What that greatness isn't just existing in a vacuum. What that is is an amalgam of all the different things we've been talking about him. We've been talking about his ability to close, which is what a champion is and which is why he's number one. We've been talking about his hand speed, his focus, his ability, his intelligence, everything that he does, his memory. It's, a, it's not just one thing. It's everything that makes him who he is and what puts him at number one. But more importantly than that, let's talk about this list in general as a whole. Every group of 10, give or take, maybe one or two, ha represents 
a a, a group or ability uh, level of players, right? And each one, I kind of, I've been looking at it and I keep thinking in each one, there's a counterweight. There's a counterbalance that happens near the top of each group of 10 that we've been talking about. And at the very top of the 50, you have the greatest counterbalance of all, which is going to be the number one in this case is, is, is uh, Colignon. And what that creates for us as fans, as people that talk about foosball a lot, is context. Who is it that he was beating? Who is beating him in the time frame that he played in? And that sets the tone for that top 10. That sets the tone for the 10 beneath that and the 10 beneath that and the 10 beneath that. He is basically at the baseline. And if, if you're doing testing for different things, he's the control. Federico Colignon is the control. And that's something to think about going forward because that everybody is going to be compared to him forever and ever and ever. Mm-hmm. Which is why Federico Colignon, given everything that he has done and everything that he is, is number one. Mm. No doubt. Gosh, I can't believe it's over, guys. It is. Oh, no, it's over. Not, it's not. We're just starting. We start. <laughs> We're about, about 12 minutes to talk about all this, but what a what a great job by by everyone on this. Great, you know, I, I was sitting back listening to you two guys uh and just amazed by what I was hearing. That was that was yes. great stuff by both you guys. Thank you. Thank you. The well, bios thank make you. your the bios yeah, really Tom. substantiate everything. You know, it, Tom. thank you, Tom for yeah <laughs> everything that you are you are the counterbalance no. of my heart buddy and that was pro professional stuff hey guys a couple of things all right here here there were there were 50 players obviously right um 51 players actually there were 45 men and six women on the list there were 49 americans two international players of course uh, fred and, and moya 10 players from the state of colorado 10 mm. players from the state of texas Ooh. six from minnesota five from Florida, three from California, two from Illinois, two from Oklahoma, and then one from Oregon, Massachusetts, Idaho, Kentucky, Washington, Wisconsin, Michigan, <laughs> San, uh, South Dakota, Ohio, um, Nevada, and Alabama. And of course, from uh, British Columbia and Belgium as well. But what a what a list. Yeah. And, um, you know, we have a few minutes to kind of talk about the process. We have a little bit to talk about maybe some things that that we saw differently, uh, some changes we would have made. So, um, but th- th- you know, we went quite long on the first part, but we got a few minutes. Jim, so it just really bugs me. It. it really bugs me. In the beginning of the show, Tom called it an enchilada. I just really can't <laughs> get, over, can't get over it. Get, yeah. get over it already. Man. <laughs> wow. Well, so <laughs> we could, I mean, we could talk. Of, uh, I'm sorry, Tom. No, that's all right. I'm just saying just, somebody's got to be neutral. Go, Whatever. Go. <laughs> what do we well, look, look, man? This list. Go ahead, Adam. Please talk. I'm waiting for you. I, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. This has been emotional. This has been yeah. emotional. And I told, I told, I told, it I had. told you, Jim, and I told you, Mark. Like, um, and I, I uh, when we first started talking about doing this, I didn't want to do it, and I didn't want to do it because it's like, how this is an apples to Bentleys, you know? Like, how do you even? Yeah go down this thing and i think and i think it's i i'm happy with what we have and i think again it's going to incite obviously it already has been a lot of conversation about it but um it, i think it needed to be done and i'm i'm happy with what we have but okay. if i do have one thing i don't i feel like Atkinson should have been higher but i just like what do you how do you what do you how what do you do look, you know look you, we got i think we got the top 10 yeah right and i think we could have i think when when we got argumentative which was good, a healthy exchange and transaction. Uh, to, I mean, Tommy was what? He was like 11, right? So what do you do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then right. and like, I, I think I think there could be arguments that Murray was too low, that Bacon was too low. Horton, who I talked to, I told you, like yeah. an hour, like two hours, he'll argue to the death that he should have been higher. And there's some argument that he should have been higher. But it he means someone has been in the top 10, but but it really was his own doing that he wasn't, right? I mean, really, when we are putting this list together, um, we are painted, our, our, our opinions and our votes are, are painted by other things that might have happened during the course of, in this case, Horton's or, career. Or right? to, to color that differently, it's painted by how much more they could have done if they yeah. had um, made different choices of the way you describe right. it. And That's right, so like point. Billy's another one, right? I mean, if, if uh, we could talk about this, but would I mean, Billy could have been swapped out for Tommy or Johnny. Eh, maybe even Murray, but definitely between yeah. Johnny, there's strong arguments for Bacon. 
So like, mm, it's very, very sure. difficult, man. Very, the, very the difficult. The eye test, the eye test put Billy in the top 10 and that, that, that run of singles championships, no doubt right. about it. That was huge. But we have a guy in the top 10 in Billy Pappas who won seven major titles. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? And yet, yet yeah. none of us really have any problem with him being there. Yes, you could have no. put Horton higher. You could have put Atkus in there. But the other thing for me, uh, we talk about the 70s, right? Eight, basically 75 through 81 and what a what a, what a a condensed, concentrated level of, of play there was, a high-end play, right? Um, but how many players from that decade were kind of penalized by the fact that they had such, such short careers? Because we certainly put a lot of yeah. credence in, in longevity in the case of Tom Yore and others, right? And also, you know, 81, really, and you, you kind of talked about this earlier. I think we were talking about Furry, and, and you mentioned it, Adam. But after the, the crash of TS, after the big money, after uh, this was a career for them, how could they really adapt to playing for that much less right. money? You know, if yeah. you guys did, Spear continued on, a few others. But how could you really, right? After you're doing this, you, you, you have this in, in, in your sights of making a career and good money, and then suddenly it's gone. How can you go out and play for three thousand dollars when you had been playing for 25 you know so how many players were penalized by short careers during that era these are all the things folks that we had to deal with when putting this list together and so much more yeah Yeah. yes it's a rough one uh bias is a thing another another interesting thing is that with the four of us um you know and i i guess this isn't a a big thing but we all had number one and number two exactly the same And, and i think most people probably would. Now, a lot of people might have thought maybe Spraydeman sneaks over uh, um, Lafredo. And if Tony had have tossed in another two to three to five doubles championships at the Worlds, maybe right. he would have. Maybe mm-hmm. he would have snuck past Lafredo potentially. But we all had uh, Colignon one, all had uh, Lafredo two. Um, and I think most people probably would. I had some arguments uh, in private messages about Lafredo being above Fred because Lafredo is Fred's basically mentor and maybe Fred never picks up the American game. I don't buy into that though. I think that Fred, Fred is going to maybe takes a little bit longer, but Fred has to win those singles and mixed doubles without Todd. And uh, Fred mm-hmm. is going to get there one way or the other. So I don't, I, I don't buy into that. Um, I think Fred is deservingly, I mean, how could he, he is his weakest table and all he did was wipe the floor Isn't with Americans. Something? for 20 Isn't years it's crazy yeah it's absolutely right. but but also when you when you when you talk about the wins of pappas or sprayed him in you know um it, in, in, or even ryan moore in singles you always say and he beat frederick colignon in the final you know and it, yeah. it's like wow he also yeah. that, that adds to theirs it's like strength of schedule in college right. football or whatever this adds to their you know legendary status to their legacy uh as well so in um, our defense though Jim, in our, again in our yeah. defense that 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 argument also was deep in our discussions the other way. So in our discussions, and I'm not sure if I was on an island on this by myself, but I feel strongly that the weakest era of modern American foosball at the top level has been from 2010 to now. And the reason why is because Fred basically retires and Billy essentially drops off the face of the earth. And those are when you get two super mega talents like that, that are in their playing prime. I mean, Fred triples and he quits. Billy could still be winning all he wanted if he didn't get, if he wasn't focused on other stuff, frankly. So uh, when you get, let's just, imagine, we, we saw it in basketball. I'll use this analogy again. Michael Jordan wins three championships and then he goes to play baseball and then it's like a complete parody and then he comes back and wins three more. So we had to well, leverage will... that and calibrate that. Go ahead. You want to say something? For sure. And I will yeah. I will argue that the 1990s were actually one of the weakest times um, in, in, in the NBA when he won his six world championships. It was not the 80s. It was not the Sixers and the Lakers. Okay, and the Celtics. Laker bias. Um, okay, Laker in, bias. In, 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 no, I think that's just a, a fact. But uh, 2010, so look at it this way. And we, we talked about this, I think, off the air a week or two ago. But I will match up uh, the, the next, you know, the problem is that you've got Ryan Moore and Tony Spraderman. Now, if you have, mm-hmm. if Fred had to continue, you know, because he, he quit for basically the money wasn't there, Pappas for his own particular reasons, whether it was involved with something else, poker, et cetera, or just disenchantment with the American tour or lack of money. Mm-hmm. But you have these two guys, these true transcendent players in Tony Spraderman and Ryan Moore, right? Sitting up there at the top. Well, let's look at the next 10 players on tour. And I actually think they they compare pretty favorably to that group of the 90s when there really was no 
great, great player. There was Terry Moore. There was Todd Lafredo. There was Tommy Atkinson, all of whom obviously made it. Robbie top was 11. pretty damn good. Dave was pretty 13. damn good. But they are not in the class. They're not these transcendent, all-time great, um, setting the bar higher and higher players like Tony Sprademan and Ryan Moore. So it's almost like you got to throw them out of the mix because these two guys were so good for various reasons, second generation, dedicated to the sport all these various reasons. They were the two guys just head and shoulders above anyone else. Then that next 10, though, is comparable to what we had in the 90s. I don't think, and while I won't say that it's as strong as the 90s, the 2010s, I don't think it's as weak as, as you make it out to be. I think it's still, the one thing that we don't see in, in, uh, in, in the 2010s until maybe the last few years is the number of players, the number of rounds that these guys had to play, right? Yeah. In the 90s, Huge. they had to get in. Once they got to the six, round of 16, although you look at a world championship these days, round of 16, pretty strong. But you, they didn't have to play as many rounds and maybe as many rounds against uh, comparable players as, as they did in the 90s and certainly not in the 70s. But, yeah, but I don't think it's as weak. I would say the weakest decade ever, and I'm, I, maybe I'm going to catch some mail for this one. You will. I think the weakest decade ever, is the 1980s just like music. yeah? Oh, anyway, probably. Music that's probably decade. true. Just that's like probably the music. True. <laughs> you know? What do you mean, just like music? Yeah, just like the music. Did you ever <laughs> listen to you YouTube? smoking crack? Like <laughs> the 80s Wait a minute, also music. Uh, I got I got to no. add. I got to <laughs> no. add something here. Uh, we touched upon it, but I mean, this is a really big deal. Is is, is generational rose tinted glasses bias? Yeah. And I'm gonna just throw that out there. And the other thing I'm gonna throw out there is at what point if you if you put Babe Ruth in a time machine and jump him up to the 30s, 40s, 50s. When does the accumulated skill level and ability and, yeah, of course, no, talent it, start yeah. dumping yeah. on the previous it's generations? True. Oh, that's true. I mean, it's huge. What's his face? What's what's the guy? Um, uh, oh my gosh, I cannot believe the 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 pitcher Barry for the, the Dodgers. No, the the, the Fernando uh, the Valenzuela. No, 60s, oh, the you're talking for this. You're talking about Sandy Koufax. Thank you. Oh my gosh, yeah. yes, the, Sandy Koufax would crush. Uh, Babe Ruth, left, right, center. No, no question about he, it. He would crush guys these days as well. Right, yeah. I know, but I mean, so, but that being said, that's my point. When we yeah, talk, but so about look, the you'll never get an argument from me that the physical skill of the modern player isn't of the average modern player. By the way, like Tommy Brewer is like an amateur, yeah. maybe just turned expert out of Florida, and his skill level is pretty damn incredible, comparably to where we started in the nineties. It's it is it still is, <laughs> but here, but here's the difference. The difference is this. There are a lot less players. There were 200 right. pro paper pros and masters in the I 90s agree. easily. There were 200. And guess what you had to do? You had to prepare for a lot more players. I mean, they would see the, the masters back then knew who everyone was playing with. They'd see the bracket out a month in advance, and they'd, they'd prepare for these 16 other teams. You don't got to do that now. Tony's got to prepare for Ryan and maybe Billy and probably not Billy. That's it. You prepare for those two. Maybe Tommy Orr, but Tommy Orr's not even playing anymore. So it's just different in that regard. It's right. No, different. I agree. No, because my dad was telling me like the, the worlds, when they set up for worlds in 75 or whatever, they had four or 500 tables. Tables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Tables. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's unbelievable. And, and it, it just, guys, that's it, a different thing. You know, I, we're right up against it. Let's continue this next week. Yeah. Yes. Well. There's sure. so we much got to. to talk about we got yeah. as well. We're going to find a hook for the fans, too, to keep this thing going, because the conversation is... Ask us well, anything, no, yeah, ask yeah. Us anything well, about we'll the top it. 50. I think right. we should ask us anything, and maybe we could have an informal uh, uh, poll, and we could discuss that and talk about, through that lens, what it's like going through that process. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Because there's already people with opinions. Yeah, feel free to reach out, uh, insidefoos.com uh, or uh, foosballradio.com. It's info at foosballradio.com if you want to email We'll start well. a post. Or we'll even start at Inside Foos TV. Uh, yeah. Inside Foos TV, yeah. Facebook as well, um, any yep. of those. And uh, yeah, let's continue this conversation. It's a fascinating one as we it head is. into um, the new year, 2022. Well, yep. I have to say, after all this, uh, the, the 50, the 50 you've gone through, plus the, the honorable mentions, I'm astounded at how well you guys did. And uh, wow, let's do this again next year. What do you think? Oh, well, boy. I might need therapy. I, I might need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> we need a support group first. So we'll I'd say, you know, every every few years, I think a minimum okay. of three years, I think probably in between, maybe even five, as, as we let players develop like Sullivan and and, and some of the others, Majority, sure. et cetera. So Blake, yeah. great job by both of you. I, I am such fans of Mark Torres and Adam Gilson and you as well, Tom Robinson, that it's just a pleasure to, to work with you guys and be a part of not only uh, this, this particular uh, task that we were that we took on, but also this show in general. So cool. thanks guys. Thanks Jim. And awesome. uh, yeah. group hug. 
Yeah. Good bug. <laughs> uh, no, uh, thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Absolutely, month. and again, uh, we, cheers to uh, to twenty twenty two. It's a brand. New it's a year. grinding. It's a grinding dumber dumber hug for me. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> there you have it. We hope you enjoyed this look back on the Foos Talk Live top fifty foosball players on the American tour of all time. Once again, happy Mother's Day. I'm Tom Robinson, and we'll return next Sunday at nine p.m. Eastern Daylight Time with another edition of Foos Talk Live. Thanks so much for tuning in. Foosball tournaments are everywhere. Foos Talk Live proudly presents a weekly update of events near you with the Foos Talk Live Tournament Beat. Here's what's up. Don't miss Texas State 2022, the Players' Championship, May 27th through the 30th at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport Marriott Hotel, Dallas, Texas. Here comes the 2022 Seattle Open, June 17th through 19th at Bolero, South Seattle, 100 Andover Park West, Seattle, Washington. It's the 2022 ITSF World Cup and World Championships, June 28th through July 2nd, Nantes, France. The South Florida Foosball Club proudly presents the 2022 Beachtown Beatdown, July 15th through the 17th in Lake Worth Beach, Florida. Registration details coming soon. Don't forget the 2022 National Championship North American Cup, July 20th through July 24th. It's been moved to the Clarion Hotel and Conference Center, Lexington, Kentucky. It's the first annual Ozark Open, Sunday, August 15th, 2588 North Gregg Street, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Just announced the 2022 $10,000 Michigan State Foosball Championships, sponsored by Foos Gadgets. September 30th through October 2nd at the Hilton Garden Inn, Lansing West, Lansing, Michigan. Each week, we do our best to give you the most up-to-date listing of foosball tournaments near you. If you have an event you would like to add, send us all the details at info at foosballradio.com. Tune in every week for the Foos Talk Live Foosball Beat. Foos Talk Live is a product of Inside Foos, all rights reserved. Brought to you in part by InsideFoos.com, ProtectoFlex, Rodlock, 518 Prince, Foosballers the Movie, the USTSO, and Foosball Clubs USA. Tune in again next week for another episode of Foos Talk Live. In the meantime, we'll see you soon.